Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another session of the NCCR CSST. Um, we have some new people on the line tonight, so just to kind of talk to everybody about a few things first. Uh, we're going to be covering tonight modules five, and then we're going to get into module six. I'm hoping to complete it in its entirety tonight, but it's uh, pretty much the longest module that we have throughout this whole thing. It's almost 40 pages, and it's related to uh, module five is employee motivation, which we're going to move through pretty quickly. Module six is going to be uh, site-specific EHS plans, and we're going to be working out of the safety technology book tonight. Okay, so um, see we got some new people on. Uh, anybody who's on a computer, you can feel free. You'll, you'll see that you should have a, uh, a message window where you can send messages back and forth, a chat feature. If you want to send any messages, feel free to. Okay, and then uh, anybody who's on a cell phone, we know it's hard for you to swing back and forth. So, so don't worry about it, you know, unless you really want to. Okay, so, uh, so great. We're going to go ahead and kick it off, folks. And then for anybody who's watching this after uh, on a recorded session after tonight, uh, just so you know, there won't be any answer back, okay? So, uh, but any questions that do happen, uh, the attendees uh, won't see them on the screen, but I'll go ahead and go ahead and repeat them. So give me one moment. We're going to pause for just a moment, and then we're going to kick it off, okay? Alrighty, great folks. Uh, no, uh, uh, one moment, please. Uh, Dave, no, you're good where you are. So that's why we're doing module by module. Um, that way you can start where you are and, um, and then you can start going back and catching the modules that you want, okay? So each module is independent of each other. And that's why pretty much for the most part now, we stop at the end of a module unless we absolutely have to go into the next module, okay? So, so you'll be good with that. Okay, great, folks. Um, so just, uh, just to kind of clarify that a little bit more, folks, um, and I know we've said it in some previous modules as well, we're starting on Module 5 tonight. There's no need to have covered Module 1 through 4 or the Field Safety Book. So each module is independent of each other, and they don't actually build on each other. So there is a little bit of information that we'll cross-reference, but, uh, but if, I, if I say that I, need, that I need to get you up to speed, I will. Okay? All right, great, folks. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and kick off, and we're going to be at uh, – at module 5.1 and and most of you know that I'll go back and forth between the webinar um, we're gonna go ahead and just cover most of the main points out of each module tonight and then also I'll be showing you some additional searches on the internet as well okay and then um, we'll be doing some fishing expeditions like we normally do where uh, sometimes I'll show you stuff that I already have pre set up and then sometimes I'll show you stuff and we'll go ahead and go on a little fishing expedition between the OSHA standards and then also other resources that are available for us on the internet okay all right, great, folks. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about communication, right? And we're going to talk about different levels of communication. Primarily, we're looking at three different types, right? We're looking at verbal communication. We're going to be talking about nonverbal communication. And then, of course, also we're going to be talking about written communication as well. Okay, just to, just to give you an example, you know, um, and I'm at, on page 5.1. Basically, a typical person will spend about 80% of their day communicating through re writing, speaking, listening, you know, or using nonverbal communication, right? Like our body language as well. And then um, of that time, certain studies suggest that approximately about 20% of the communication is written. About 80% of it involves speaking and listening. Okay. So ju just so you know where it's coming from. Um, so let's talk a little bit about verbal communication first. And what are we talking about, right? We're talking about our spoken words, actually the words that we, we select or we elect to use in a conversation uh, between two or more people, right? And for some of us, even when we're talking to ourselves, right? 
So, you know, we all know it can be done face to face. It can be done uh, via telephone, two way radios. And of course, it can also be done, as you notice, during this webinar, right? During this webinar, you'll see that we're talking, to, we'll be using uh, verbal communication, which I'm going verbal to you guys. Um, we'll be using written communication, which I'll be typing things in. If you have questions, you can type them in. And then we'll also be using some nonverbal. And, and part of that, I'll even go as so far to say it's what I select to, uh, to show you. OK, um, on the Internet and then on the searches. So I think even that part of it could be considered uh, written, but it could also be considered nonverbal as well. OK. All right. So great. So let's go ahead and uh, and use some examples. If you look at uh, if you look at the illustration on page five point two and you'll see the four items that we're talking about, sender, receiver, message and feedback. And what are we looking at? Right. We're just looking at it. It's a cyclical. It's a cyclical. It's a, it's a cyclical uh, device, and basically, we got information, right? We've got the sender sending the message out. The person's receiving it. The receiver's receiving it, sends the message back to the sender. This can be through active listening. This can be through body language. So it's just a constant cycle of, message, of information out, information in, right? Information out, information in. And, it, and sometimes, as we all know, we can be speaking at the same times verbally or non-verbally, so it could be communication going back and forth continuously, okay? So the sender, who is it? It's the person that creates the message, right? It's a, the message that's being communicated. Normally, we're talking about verbal communication, and what are we saying? We're saying the message aloud, and we're presented to the intended parties or the intended persons that we're meaning to send it to. Also, um, we have to be sure that things that we have to make sure that we keep in mind, right? Speaking clearly. Also in a concise manner uh, to make sure that we're easily understood. You know, items like, you know, obviously, you know, controlling mumbling, right? Articulating properly, items like that as well. So, and it's not an easy task. Um, it definitely takes a lot of practice. And I think that we're continuously groomed for it, right? Throughout our school age years and then definitely within our professional development and hopefully at home as well before we even get and during our school years as well. So basic tips that NCCR is, is recommended, right? Basic tips for considering uh, for becoming an effective sender of information. Let's avoid talking with anything in our mouth, like food, gum, a pen, whatever the case may be. Uh, also, find an appropriate rate of speed. Uh, don't talk too quickly. Don't talk too slowly. Um, as most of you know, I tend to talk fast. I slow it down once I start recognizing it. It's still probably a little bit faster paced than most. But as most of you know, um, it, it's a continuous work for me, okay? Um, it's also important because some situations, people tend to focus on the rate of speed of speech instead of what we're actually saying. So sometimes I do, folks. I have to be really cognizant to slow down my conversation because I want to make sure that no one misses anything, right? And then sometimes I also know when I can kind of pick up that speed in order to make up a little bit more time. OK, well, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about that. Uh, I also implement and tone into that as well. Uh, also being aware of our tone, like I was just talking about. Right. Remembering it's not just what we say, but it's how we also say it. So perfect example. Someone asked me where the safety reporting sheets are and I say safety reporting sheets are in the corner. Right. OK, good. Now I can start changing the emphasis on the words. I can say the safety sheets are in the corner or i can say the safety sheets are in the corner or i can say the safety sheets are in the corner so you see you see where i'm going depending on where we put the emphasis on our words right also the type of tone that we use and then the rate of speed that we use we can take the same sentence and totally change the the meaning that we're sending out and the message that we want received on on the receiver okay also, in addition to that, we also want to make sure that we enunciate to prevent any type of misunderstandings. Uh, certain letters like T, T is in Tom, D is in dog, B is in Bravo, E is in Echo, right? It's often letters that are often, um, that we're often clarifying. And, and let me tell you, folks, I, I learned this one the hard way over time. I can't tell you how many times I would say my name. And people would say, oh, this is Ed. So when enough people think I say Ed, it might just be something about me. So what do I do? 
I slow it down, right? Or I'll say, oh, this is Douglas Castro or Doug Castro. And then that way they know, and I've clarified that Doug is just a short, right? That, that I often go by, okay? And then also don't talk in a monotone. Uh, don't talk monotone, all right? Put some type of enthusiasm and feeling in our voice. But at the same time, let's remember this. Sometimes we do need to speak monotone and um, or or maybe not monotone, but in one tone for that particular moment. Um, when I often use it is when I talk about maybe injuries or illnesses that I've investigated or fatalities. And once I get into those, I'll definitely tend to slow down my speech. I'll tend to use a, a, a more of a serious and deeper tone because of its seriousness, right? Because I know it affected so many people's lives. And, um, and of course, I don't even think I do it intentionally anymore. I think it's just subconsciously that I do it now. And I kind of changed my tone and my demeanor at that point. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's talk about, so remember those, right? That the T is in times, the D is in dogs, the B's and bravos, the E's and echoes. A lot of times, like we said, those can kind of uh, sound the same depending at the rate and speed that we're, that we're talking. Um, now let's talk about the message, right? It's what the it's what the sender's attendant to attempting to send to the to the receiver, right? It can be a set of instructions, directions. It can be an opinion. It can be a feeling. Okay, um, whatever its function, the message is an idea or a fact that the sender wants to convey, and that they want it received, right? They want the receiver to receive it the way that they're conveying it. So before speaking, things that we have to determine, right, is is what are we communicating, right? What do we want to communicate, okay? We, we should also uh, organize what we want to say. We want to ensure that the message is logical and complete. A lot of times we also want to make sure that we take the time to clarify our thoughts so that we prevent any type of rambling, um, not getting the message across effectively or confusing people, right, or confusing the audience. Um, it also permits us to go ahead and get the quick to the point more quickly sometimes also. So I think a lot of it is, um, this is the best way I can think I can describe it is let's try to speak as directly as we can, but as politely as we can. Okay. Does that, does that seem like a, does that seem like a fair message? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. All right. And then of course, in delivering that message, right? What do we want to do? We want to consider that audience, right? We want to consider whoever the receiver is. Um, it's important not to talk down to people. You know, I, I tell people, and, and and I've gotten a lot of, um, most of the courses that I teach have evaluations at the end. And one of the things that I, I feel blessed with and I feel privileged with is that people have, have often told me that um, I include everyone in the conversation or I try to include everyone in the conversation. I don't talk down to people. I don't talk at people. And that I don't dismiss the messages or the questions that are being brought. And um, and I hope I hope that's the case. You know, but if it is the case, and, and I hope it's the case, I think it's because it's maybe certain things that have happened to me in the past, either certain ways that I've been treated that I like, you know, or certain ways that I've been treated or spoken to that I don't like. So therefore, I try to, I try to, um, to maybe uh, give my best delivery, right? Okay. So and the things we want to do also is maybe try to avoid technical language, right? Um, and slang when possible. So uh, perfect examples of this is... Um, it's over yonder, you know, what's a yonder, right? <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, it could be something like that. It could also be something like if we're talking about, let's say hazardous chemicals, and let's say we're talking about the uh, time weighted averages, right? TWAs. If it's someone who's not familiar with how to calculate chemicals and, and exposure times uh, to those chemicals, TWAs and time-weighted averages won't make sense. So sometimes maybe we have to convey the information, but maybe we don't have to go into as much detail. But we should at least at a minimum maybe explain what a time-weighted average is, right, or a TWA is, and um, just not get into too deep. Um, as you recall, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago when we did the last session, we talked about starting from um, known material and then going on to the unknown material. That way, it's we're less likely to lose the audience, and uh, we're we're more likely to keep people engaged. Okay, so 
Uh, so just just let's just kind of remember that, right? And then of course um, try to try to work with uh, short sentences, okay, to give the audience or our receivers time to understand and digest the point they're going that we're going to make as well, okay. So try to keep it hopefully one topic per sentence or one topic per paragraph. Uh, but we all know it's not always it's not always possible, but uh, but often it is, okay. And then let's talk about the receiver for a minute. The receiver, who is it? It's the person who's going to receive the message, right? That, that the message is being communicated to that person or to that group of people. And then, and it's basically to complete that communication process, right? Or to start that, rather, to start that communication process so that we can have uh, feedback and conversation and discussion going back and forth in order to complete that process. So things that we want to remember about being a good listener, they involve, they involve realizing um, that there are many barriers that are going to get in the way of our listening, right? Uh, especially like on a construction job site. So, let, let's, so let's use some examples of them, right? Um, items like noise, visitors, uh, telephones, okay, and any other distractions that may exist. Um, so you notice that the first thing that they said there was noise, right? So let me ask you folks and, and chime in. Feel free to chime in if um, if you know it. And if you don't know it, um, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk about it. I did a study on it a while back on hearing protection and noise. But what is the def what is the difference between noise and sound? Anybody care to chime in? Or just take a stab at it? Remember, you have total anonymity, right? Nobody else is seeing it. I'll, I'll just repeat the comment. And, you know, if, if we see it, good, bad, or indifferent, right? Okay. Yeah, noise is loud. Okay, that's a good example. High pitch. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, sound, music. Okay, good. Okay, so yeah. So let, let's talk about the difference, right? When we're talking about sound, it's items that we want to hear. It's this discussion that we're trying to have right now, right? Uh, or listen to this webinar. Um, it may also be items like... Um, you know, a conversation that we're trying to have, a movie that we're trying to see, a song that we're trying to uh, listen to, whatever what, whatever the case may be, right? It's something that we want. Noise, on the other hand, often it's going to be things like, you know, construction noises, right? Bells, whistles, wind, animal sounds, other people discussing things. Um, but the, the primary difference between noise and sound is that basically noise is unwanted sound. Okay, so sound is what we want to hear, right? I want to hear that message, or I want to hear that song, or I want to hear that show. And then noise, noise interferes with our ability to hear the sound. So it's un, so so noise is unwanted sound. So if all of a sudden, and let's say if, if one of you are on the other end, and let's say you are watching the news, right, or you're watching a TV show, and you have more importance on the TV show than you have on this conversation, I'm your noise right now. Right. But on the flip side, if somebody out there is more interested in this webinar right now and any other outside factors that you're hearing right now, and then that's going to be noise. Whether you have anim uh, pets in the background, right, uh, kids, uh, family members, uh, vehicle noise. It's raining not where I am right now. Uh, so it's noise. So uh, so that's all the differences. Right. So. OK. So let's come back. Right. Noise, visitors, telephones and other distractions. Also, preoccupation, right? Being under pressure or daydreaming. Uh, people drift. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of it a lot of times, you know, and, and, uh, and I hate it. And I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I often apologize for it. And, and I'll wind up drifting in the conversation from time to time. Uh, also, reacting emotionally, right, to what's being communicated. It may be uh, reacting emotionally to something to where it saddens us, it angers us, it elates us. Uh, just, it just depends, right? Also thinking about how to respond to the question instead of listening. Sometimes we're so busy trying to prepare our answer or prepare our next question that we're not actually listening or actively listening to the speaker. Instead, rather, we're letting them talk, but we're, but we're preparing our ammunition, right, for, for the next thing that we're going to say. And then also, in addition to that, is given an answer before the message is complete. So a lot of times, and, and again, I'm guilty as charged, right? Uh, sometimes we're so busy, we say something or someone says something, we don't like it or we don't agree right off the beginning. Instead of letting them finish, we're already jumping in, telling them that they're wrong or we're already jumping in and correcting the fact of, of, of what they're saying, right? 
Um, also, uh, personal biases. It may, it, you know, uh, things like, uh, let's say, politics, right? Uh, business views, um, you know, religion, right? Just different biases. It could be regional biases, right? Uh, prejudices. So uh, just different biases that people may have. And then sometimes finishing the sentence, the sender's sentence for them. Um, again, you know, I've been on both sides of this, right? Been guilty of finishing people's thoughts for them or, or what they're trying to say. And then I've also been walked on. I, I, I tell people I equate it to I'm on the radio keyed up trying to talk and somebody else is keying up on top of me. They're walking over my conversation. I think that when we do it, what we're doing is we're walking over that person's conversation or they're walking over our conversation. Okay, so the following tips can definitely help us overcome those barriers. Right. Um, Take steps to minimize or remove distractions. Um, Learn to tune out other surroundings. Right. Maybe move into a quieter area. Uh, Maybe turn off that TV or that radio or 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 quit looking at that phone of ours. Right. Um, Listen for key points. Items in the conversation that will hopefully keep us more engaged, um, where we can take notes, whether it's handwritten notes or mental notes, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with taking notes. Uh, it's really a good practice. Uh, it's where we're using another device, a memory aid, right, to help us. And not only that, we, it can kind of give us the opportunity to ask for a little bit more clarification while the speaker is uh, talking. Um, trying not to take things too personally, you know, letting people actually finish their thought. And um, maybe not debating as much, uh, allowing ourselves time to process uh, our thoughts before we respond rather than just kind of blurting things out from time to time. Um, maybe to be able to maybe put it in a better perspective or a better delivery. Also, uh, letting the sender communicate the message without interrupting. Even, even if we don't agree, often it, we're better off maybe just sitting and listening and letting them complete their sentence or their thought. And, and then us following through uh, behind it. And then uh, being aware of personal biases and trying to stay open-minded, right? And just and just accepting the fact that sometimes we're not going to see eye to eye. Okay? We're just, sometimes it's just not going to happen. Okay? So let's talk about feedback a little bit. And what are we talking about, right? We're talking about it refers to the communication that occurs after the message has been sent and received. So often it involves the receiver responding uh, to the message, Feedback is going to be an important part of our communication process because it's going to kind of tell us how the how the receiver interpreted the message. All right. And it also is going to let us know uh, that the sender uh, know whether the message was understood as it was intended. And then feedback is a way to make sure that the receiver and the sender understand each other. You know, I recently had this happen with somebody. Um, we did not agree. And we were continuously having a discussion um, I was trying to be really cognizant about not walking over her conversation. And um, and it was to the point to where she just continuously kept on walking over the conversation that I had, to, I had to ask her to give me the opportunity and the time to talk. And then I found myself walking over her conversations. So we kind of had to, the, uh, to scale it back a little bit. And in the end, she's like, oh, well, we just don't we don't understand what each other's saying. And I said, no, I said, we understand what each other's saying. We just don't agree. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we don't have to always convince the other person and see something to fruition. Sometimes we just have to put our message out there and also accept the message that someone else is uh, and putting out there, accept their opinion. But it doesn't mean that we have to change ours or vice versa. Or, or maybe we should ha- take it into consideration if necessary and if it's for the better good, right? So just different ways, right? Also, the receiver can use uh, the opportunity to provide feedback to paraphrase what we just heard. So a lot of times we can repeat or, portions of what we heard or some clarification of what we heard in order to make sure that we um, we have a better understanding of it, right? And, and make sure that both parties are on the same page. And then uh, feedback also gives the receiver the opportunity to clarify the meaning of the message, right? Um, and to request more information if necessary. And that's if we, especially if we stay open-minded, we can definitely have some really good, effective uh, communication, right? Okay. And then... Um, and then let's talk a little bit about nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication, you know, things that we that we can actually see, right, when we're communicating with other people. So perfect examples or the best examples are facial expressions, right? Body movements, hand gestures, eye contact. So uh, those are probably the best indicators of how the the uh, receiver, uh, the listener, is receiving that message. 
and or what basically what their opinion is, right? Or what our opinion is in that in that case. Also, nonverbal communication, it can provide the external uh, signal of the individual's inner emotions, right? It kind of it's kind of our tell, right? People start to understand what how we feel before we even say anything. Um, it often occurs simultaneously with verbal communication. Um, it actually uh, occurs simultaneously when we're hearing the message and then also, again, when we're delivering our message as well. Okay, And often we may not even be aware that we're doing it. Uh, if anybody plays cards right out there or any types of games or uh, where maybe you're looking at uh, your own cards or the game and people get excited, they, you know, a lot of times you hear it in poker, right? People on bridge, people say that that person has a tell. And it basically is not nonverbal communication that that person's shown that they're either excited or they're disturbed. And it's often because of, of what they're holding in their hand. Okay. Okay. And then, um, so because it, because it can be physically observed, right? Nonverbal communication is just as important as the words. Often, in my opinion, they're going to be even more important a lot of times. Okay. And it's true because people are often influenced by nonverbal signals more than spoken words. We, we communicate far more through nonverbal communication than by uh, verbal communication on a regular basis. Okay. So it's important that we consider our, and we be conscious, right, of our nonverbal clues, uh, of what message we're sending back to, to that receiver. Okay. So that they don't improperly interpret our message or that we don't put out the message that we don't want out at the time, possibly. Okay. Um, or, or escalate a situation, you know, and if you do, you know, just remember it can affect the current communication, right? It can definitely affect it. And normally it's probably going to affect it to the negative. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. I'm at 2.3 now, folks. I'm at 5.3, 5, 5 page 5.3. And I'm at 2.3.0. 2 which is uh, the written and visual communication. So remember, right, some communication is going to be written and visual. Perfect example of this often nowadays is uh, emails, right? It used to be faxes, right? Text messages also, right? It used to be uh, the old reader beeper, right? You put different codes in for different numbers in for different messages. Um, it could be things like signs, hand signals, postings, okay? All different uh, examples of, of written vis and visual communication. OK, uh, many messages right on the job have to be communicated in text form. OK, examples include like weekly reports, uh, requests for changes. Right. Um, it could be purchase orders. It could be correspondence uh, to specific subjects. It could be safety audits. Uh, uh, JSA is perfect example. Right. That's all written communication, folks. OK, JSA, we're trying to the employers trying to convey to us the risk that still exists. And also our, and, and the importance for us to recognize those risks properly and safely work. And then also for us to document, right, and report any new risk that are discovered in that same job process. So uh, there's a perfect example how the J, JSA, right, or the, or the TSA, the Task Safety Analysis, or the Job Safety Analysis would come into play with that. And then these items are, um, you know, written because uh, they have to be recorded, right, for contractual and historical purposes. Uh, a lot of times it's for insurance issues, right, government issues, management issues. So, so that's why we're actually documenting the information. And then uh, some communication on the job, it's going to have to be uh, visual because uh, items are too difficult to explain verbally. You know, a perfect example of this might be a load chart for a crane, right, might be a work order might be a, um, a job survey or a plat, okay? These are all exam perfect examples. Um, you know, a JSA, again, uh, and a TSA, like we were just talking about. That's why the writer has to consider the actual meaning of the words, right, or the diagrams, and how others are going to interpret it. Um, it's also important uh, for all handwriting to be legible and for the message to be understood. So if we're handwriting, uh, or even if we're printing, we need to make sure that it's large enough and legible enough, right? So, again, basic tips for, for, for adequate writing, avoiding emotion-packed words or emphasis. So this is one thing I'll tell you is that remember this, the tone when we write a message, when we write a text, when we write an email, right, or we write a blog or whatever the case is, often the tone is in the reader, is the tone is, the, is in the perception of the reader, 
not necessarily in the perception of the writer. It's how it's received and not necessarily how it's given. Sometimes we know and we can and we can demonstrate, right, that we're excited, that we're upset, that we're angry. Uh, we won't tolerate it. You know, you type in all caps if you're really happy. Or you type in all caps if you're really angry. So, you know, there are different um, methods of doing written messages and language in order to uh, begin to show other people how we feel. But sometimes also it may be ambiguous, right? It may not be necessarily clear. So we may be uh, shooting something that may be just normal or we're a little excited about. And on the other side, they may think it's offensive or maybe we didn't use, maybe we didn't use the proper words or we didn't use enough words. Okay. Uh, another example of it. Also being positive within it whenever possible, right? You avoid using that technical language or jargon again. Um, uh, I tell people a lot of times, you'll hear me, if I talk about PPE, that's one of the ones now I don't really do a lot, but I do if I do an OSHA 10 hour. PPE, right? Personal protective equipment. You know, TWA, time weighted averages, right? NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. So a lot of times, folks, like you've seen in the past, in the past webinars, and you'll see in the future ones, uh, JSA, right? I said job safety analysis, TSA, task safety analysis. You'll hear me say the acronym, and then you'll hear me also uh, spell it out or, and or explain what it is if necessary, right? Also sticking to the facts as much as possible, right? We want to keep as much opinion out of it as possible. Uh, providing an adequate level of detail. Uh, presenting the information in a logical manner. This is a big one, folks. Um, you'll probably see something like this when it comes to test time or evaluation time, right? Is that, you know, we have to make sure that when we present information, we, we present it in a logical manner. Chronological is great, folks. It really is, okay? But also, but more importantly than chronological is it's got to be logical because if it's not logical, we're going to lose our audience, okay? Also, avoid making judgments, right, unless we're asked to do so. I tell people a lot when I do accident and incident investigations. I tell people often, keep your opinion out of it. You might have an opinion. We're there to take the information from the people who were hurt, the people who heard something, saw something, tasted something, felt something, right? Uh, whatever the case is, sense something. So we're there to take their statements and their information, let's say after a mishap, um, and not necessarily to influence their statements uh, to us with our own opinions. Okay. Also, uh, providing an adequate level of detail, sufficient enough detail, right? Presenting the information, like I said, in a logical manner. Avoid making those judgments unless we're asked to do so, like we just talked about. Uh, check the message for spelling and grammatical errors. It's like I tell people, you know, thank, thank goodness for our spell check, right, on our phones, on our internet, um, but also our written. We, we need to make sure that we write as adequately as possible and as grammatically, and, uh, as grammatically correct as possible. Also making sure that the document is legible. I have, I, I tell people, folks, I speak fast, my writing is poor, and my drawing is even worse, right? So I know I have to take my time when I speak. I have to slow it down. When I write, I have to slow it down, and I often erase. And if I have to draw, and you're sitting in one of my training classes, or you're in a meeting with me, good luck. I really wish you the best of luck, because uh, I'm hoping that you'll make it through it, all right? I can't, I can't control the, the drawing, so sorry, folks. That's why you'll see me often go to the computer, phone, right, internet, tablet, and find you a picture or something. It's a whole lot better than me trying to draw a crane for you or an excavation for you. Okay. Also, be prepared to provide a verbal and a visual explanation if needed. Exactly what I was just talking about, right? Is that visual explanation. I'll often go to pictures, videos. Um, I'll, I'll grab uh, something off of a table. I'll, I'll grab a, a pen, right, and make it a pipe. So, um, so just depending on, on, on what we need to do. Okay, and then basic tips. I'm on page 5.4 now, folks. Basic tips for creating visual, uh, visuals include uh, providing an adequate level of detail, right? Ensuring that the diagram is large enough to be seen. Uh, avoid creating complex visuals. Don't, don't make them too complicated, right? Keep it simple. Um, present the information, again, in a logical order. You see they're talking about that twice, right? Present it in a logical order. And then be prepared to provide written and verbal communication or visual if needed again. So, you know, if we're talking about uh, flying pipe over a uh, refinery unit or within a refinery unit, a lot of times I tell people, you know, I, I start having to show them descriptions of, of what I'm talking about, right? Maybe pictures or, draw or drawings, okay? All right. So let's go ahead and talk about a few communication issues. Um. 
it's important to understand that each person communicates a little differently uh, because we're all we're all unique in our way. Right. I also I also go back a lot of times to the left brain versus the right brain kind of thing. Right. Are we more artistic or are we more technical? Right. Or are we lazy or are we too detailed? OK, so um, are we too deep? So it, it all depends. And then we have to respect it, right? It's diversity in our workplace. Uh, it can also make communication challenging at times. Uh, we have to consider the audience consists of individuals uh, from different ethnic groups, right? Different cultural backgrounds um, with varying educational levels and then different economic statuses as well. And then on top of that, and within our business, right, folks, everybody who's in safety here or anybody who's in operations or production with a safety responsibility or looking to move into safety, um, <clears throat> We're all at different levels within our own industry, right? So the key to effective communication is to acknowledge that people are different, right? It's important to be able to just to adjust our conversation style to meet the needs of whoever's on the receiving end, okay? Like I told you, folks, I, I train a lot of people from anywhere from people uh, from uh, people who have never been in construction or oil and gas or maritime before, and I'm doing a 10-hour or an orientation. Uh, I could be training uh safety technicians, right? Coordinators, or I can be doing directors, plant managers and direct and, and, um, executive level personnel. So it really just depends. And I don't change my message much, but I definitely do change it. And I may even change some of the vocabulary that I use from time to time as well, or, or the jargon that I use. Um, and then this revolve, this involves relying, um, that our message, right. Is the simple, that we're really in it the simplest way possible to avoid the use of words that many people might find confusing. Also being aware how to use technical language, right? That slang, that jargon, uh, words that have multiple meanings as well. So, uh, you know, let's say we're talking about maybe using a pipe wrench, right? And you start talking about using a cheater. A lot of people don't know what a cheater is. They don't know it's just a piece of pipe that you're gonna put over the handle that you're not supposed to, but some people put over a pipe wrench handle, right? So uh, items like that, okay, is a perfect example. Um, present the information um, in a clear, concise manner to avoid any type of rumbling, always speaking clearly, and then using good grammar, right? So, folks, let me show you really quickly. Since I was talking about a pipe cheater, I know not everybody knows what I'm talking about. So this is a perfect example, right? Let's go to a visual aid. And this, this is this is what I'm talking about, folks, is that uh, let me see if I can find a homemade cheater bar. Here you go right here. It's a perfect example. All right. You see that socket wrench? Bottom line is that that person probably needs a bigger socket wrench. That's probably a three eighths. They may need a half or a three quarter. OK, uh, with a socket on it in order to give them more leverage. OK, or, or a longer or a longer uh, handle on that socket. So look what they did. They take a piece of threaded pipe, right? Like probably a one inch threaded pipe, three quarter inch threaded pipe. They stick it in the handle and they make it a cheater. Okay, that is not acceptable. That that's not that tool is not made to be used that way. So that's that's not acceptable. Okay. So like I said, right now is a perfect example. Right? Is is I'm talking about a pipe cheater. I want to make sure that everybody's familiar with what I'm talking about. Unless it's a device or an extension like this, where the manufacturer makes it, where the manufacturer makes it in order to use it. We're not we're not allowed to use it. Okay, it's got to be made and it's got to be made or approved by the manufacturer so that we can use uh, some type of device like that with a longer handle. It's got to be engineered for us to use. Okay. All right, great. So let, let's go back to communication issues. Right, perfect example like we we're talking about. Um, effective, uh, the key to effective communication, right, is to acknowledge that people are different, like we said, right. Um, also, making sure that we meet the needs of the receivers. Um, involves relaying our message right in the simplest way possible, like we talked about, you know, and then, you know, avoid that rambling and, of course, the jargon that we just talked about, right? In addition to that, we may have to communicate our message in multiple ways or just, uh, just the level of detail and terminology that we use to make sure that everyone in the group uh, participate and understands what we're talking about. You know, some people work better with slides, right? Some people work better with discussion. Some people work better with video. Um, a lot of times, uh, our best our, our best opportunity is to kind of try to incorporate however many different mediums of uh, conversation or types of media that we can, 
uh, in order to uh, keep as many people engaged as possible and educated as possible, right? So like, for example, we may have to draw a map, right, for a visual for a person who can't comprehend directions uh, um, in a verbal or written form. I've done that here. Uh, when we do the OSHA 510s here or we do OSHA, uh, other leadership training or competent person trainings in our office, uh, when people come here, a lot of times, some people just tell me, tell me, go left, go right. Where do you want me to go? Other people, we draw a map. Now we've gotten to a point where we've printed a map, right, um, to show them where, uh, where there are places to eat around here or hotels that are nearby. Okay, perfect example. Um, also, in addition to that, uh, if you look at uh, figure two down at the bottom, Okay, how to tailor a message to our audience, right? So you see down there, it, it'll talk about verbal instructions, right? If we have an experienced crew. If we have a newer crew, look at our verbal instructions. So what happens? If it's a newer crew, we're going into greater detail, right? Because there's less information that they've probably been privileged to have learned or been part of at this time, okay? And then you see our written instructions. Uh, it could be written instructions, and then it could be a diagram map as well. OK, so the, you see that written instructions, the di diagram map depends on the person, uh, how the person is. Do, do, does the person do better by reading or does a person do better by looking at a visual aid? So th there's perfect examples of it. OK, and then also let's talk a little bit about uh, stress, right? Workplace stress, it can totally affect the communication. OK, and it, it, it's also been associated with a loss of appetite, ulcers, mental disorders, migraines, uh, difficulty sleeping, emotional instability, disruption of social and family life, right? Um, and the increased use of cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, and then stress also affects the worker's attitude and it effect, often affects our attitude, our behavior, right? Some frequently reported consequences of stress, you know, are difficulties in communicating, right? Maintaining uh, pleasant relations with coworkers, and judging um, the seriousness of a potential emergency or a situation. Okay, just to, just to name a few. Um, I'll tell you, folks, a perfect example is today, you know, and I'm kind of looking for my notes here while we're talking. Um, someone called me today from a uh, from an oil and gas pump facility, and they said, hey, Doug, can y'all do a communications class? And I said, yeah. I said, but you got to tell me what you want to communicate. Are you trying to communicate the message and training? Or is it effective communications to know that everybody's on the same page, right? Do you want it documented? Do you want it written? You know, are you doing maps and illustrations? And we got into a really deep discussion about uh, effective communication. You know, so something that I something that I did not see coming whatsoever. And I'll tell you what we called it. We called it uh, or they called it uh, essential factors of a communi of communication procedures. OK. And how to avoid how, how to avoid how to avoid misinterpretations and communication breakdowns. OK. So perfect example, like what I was talking about. Right. And it just happens to be that that was our topic tonight. I told them that was going to be our topic tonight in the NCCER. So let, let's talk about it a little bit, right? OSHA suggests the following help, right, to, to relieve worker stress. Educate employees about the job stress, right? Address work-related stress, like unreasonable workload, lack of readily available resources, and in, inadequate or unsafe equipment. Also have regular staff meetings and discussions. Establish stress management pro programs. Uh, provide flexibility and innovation by supervisors to create ultimate job arrangements. Um, a lot of times you'll see this now with cross-training, right? They'll move employees from department to department to kind of make them stronger, but also have an understanding of what other departments and groups do. Uh, provide an organized and effective work environment, right? So those are some tips from OSHA uh, about, uh, about exactly what we're talking about. And... Um, in order to hopefully help reduce or eliminate worker stress. And then a safety technician, right? Because many of us will be in the technician role or that leadership and directorship role. And uh, it's, and, and I'm sorry, they're all leadership roles, right? Uh, so even as a safety technician, we should, we should have be taking on some, some leadership responsibilities, right? Um, as a safety technician, it's important to make sure that workers are, are taking positive steps to relieve stress. Safety is one of the most important things um, to be affected if stress is not addressed. Uh, it, it, it totally starts to affect our safety infrastructure and program, and quality and productivity is also going to be impacted. Okay, so at a so that that's how quickly things can start to be affected. 
All right. So let's talk a little bit about employee motiv employee motivation, right? It means uh, getting people uh, to act and perform at a higher level of consistency, right? The ability to motivate others. You know, it's a key leadership skill. You, you see often. How many of you out there have seen how many times? Has anybody out there been through leadership training, supervisor or leadership training? Okay. And, and let me ask you, what um, other than what we've talked about or including what we've talked about, what, what, what was the main keys that they addressed? Yeah. Okay. Accountability. Okay. Adequate conversation, uh, excuse me, communication. Absolutely. Okay. Word selection. Okay, good. Yeah, so th that's it. That's exactly it, right? So it, it's everything we're talking about right now. It's that whole respective level, um, an appropriate level of, of discussion, right? Absolutely. Okay. So because safe practices often add steps to a task, right, time to the job, or paperwork to a process, employees have to be motivated to perform their job duties, right? We have to be motivated in order to take all these more appropriate steps and in order to complete the process, right? So also um, the, the discussion of work safety comes down to a choice between doing a task uh, the quick and easy way or doing it the proper and correct safe way, right? So um, so often you, you'll see, you know, it's, and what are we doing, right? Are we looking to do it the quick, easy way or we're we looking to do it uh, the good, correct, and permanent way, right? If properly instructed and motivated, right, we'll choose the correct and safe way every time. Uh, we just have to be motivated and we have to also know that we're going to be backed as well and appreciated for it, right? Also, uh, we often consider motivational techniques uh, to be limited to praise uh, to praise an employee, right? Giving bonuses or pay raises, uh, scolding someone or firing an employee. But also, uh, so while those are going to be effective pieces of motivational strategy, uh, we have to consider a lot more. There was a, there was a doctor out of, the, uh, out of FSU, out of Florida State University. His name is Dr. John Keller, right? And he basically identified and he said that there are four parts of a successful, of a successful motivational strategy, OK, he said that we have to gain attention. Right. We absolutely have to gain attention. We have to build relevance. OK. We have to instill confidence and we have to foster satisfaction. OK. So and, and, and Dr. Keller, he basically or, or was called the ARCS model of motivation. So it's so it's gain attention. Right. Build relevance. Instill confidence. And then foster satisfaction, right? A-R-C-S, okay, is what it's called. And you'll see it, folks, for anybody who's got your book tonight, it's on page 5.5. Uh, uh, for those of you who haven't received your book yet, uh, when you get it, uh, just uh, shoot me a message or a text or whatever, and, and I'll send you all the page numbers that are relevant if you need them. But like you said, like, like you know, we're, we're sticking with the same module just to make sure that we all cover it in its entirety, right? Um, also, another thing we have to remember is we want to gain attention, right? For communication to be effective, okay, the receiver has to be open and receptive to the message. So sometimes people are closed, right? Sometimes people are closed, not often, but sometimes they are. And and we there may be something we can't do about that. But, but in often cases, people want to give us the opportunity. They want to give us the opportunity. They're open to it. And they're often looking to see the message that we're going to deliver and hoping that we're not going to be the same old, same old message, right? Okay, so to motivate employees, right, what do we have to do as safety personnel? And, and if you hear me say, folks, uh, throughout this thing, safety technician, let's just call it safety personnel. You might have a title of safety technician, coordinator, manager, director, okay, lead, assistant lead, okay, uh, observer. Just depends on the organization you work for. It may be a different title, okay? So let's just call it safety professional, period. Um, it can be done in a number of ways, though, right, to gain attention, some examples of uh, ways of, of gaining attention is including having employees talk about hazardous situations and near misses, right, um, that they've experienced, citing accurate and remarkable statistics also, and then showing or describing, or describing shocking but not excessively graphic images, right? So let me go back to these three, and then and we'll give you an example of each. Um, first one is hazardous situations and near misses, right? Perfect example is, hey, has anyone been involved in here before in a ladder fall, right? If we're talking about ladders or scaffolds, has anybody in here ever fallen from a scaffold? Has anybody ever been 
almost either hit or almost hit by something that fell off of a scaffold. Perfect examples of questions to lead in with. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, cite and accurate and, and remarkable statistics, right? The OSHA focus for the four greatest hazards in construction are falls, being struck by something electrical and being caught by a machine or an atmospheric uh, environment. Okay. And then ultimately showing and describing the shocking but not excessive graphic images. There might be somebody being rolled over by a forklift. I'm sure many of you have probably seen recently um, out of one of the Asian countries, there was a, a lady who, uh, for some unknown reason, thought she was going to help pull uh, a forklift back down when it lost its uh, center of gravity and was about to flip over. And she wound up being crushed under the vehicle. You know, you know, I don't want to show a lot of blood and guts, but sometimes, you know, people may see uh, broken bones, right, or um, or detached limbs. And, you know, I, I tell people, let, let's keep it relevant, but let's not try to make it gross either, right? So, uh, so just examples of all three. And, you know, and then, of course, things like, uh, you know, like we talked about right now, right, that that whole sharing of experiences, right? Tell me, tell me, were you ever involved in that mishap, right? Were you ever injured? Were you almost injured? Tell me what happened. Um, I often tell people, you know, we, we get so busy typing PowerPoint slide after slide after slide that what we should do is incorporate a few more pictures, take out a whole lot more text, and ask a whole lot more questions. Okay. Um, so let, let me give you an example, folks. I'm going to give you an example of all three of these, right? Uh, one more time. Let's say, um, because remember, one of the, your 15 evaluations is going to be uh, to, uh, to do a three to five minute safety meeting, right? And, um, and it'll either be one or two of us and maybe a handful, a room full of people, a handful of people, just depends on where you test and who you test with. Um, but with the evaluation, you know, you know, these are three perfect examples, right? Hey, has anybody ever worked in excavation before? Yeah. Did you feel comfortable, Right. Tell me why you didn't feel comfortable, right? And then let that participant start giving us information, okay? Starting with a question. Also, and then, of course, accurate and remarkable statistics, right? 65% of all employees in construction normally work on an elevated work surface, primarily a scaffold, okay, daily. Over almost two-thirds of all employees in construction work on an elevated work surface, primarily a scaffold, daily. Think about it. That's a big number, right? And then the image, right? Hey, folks, before we start, I want to show you this quick video, okay? So there's your icebreaker, right? There's your opener. Uh, anybody out there, do me a favor, folks. Uh, let me know if uh, if you got your OSHA 500 or you got your OSHA uh, 501. You're anybody out there, a trainer for construction, general industry? Or is anybody out there, are you training for your organization for anything, PEC, Safe Land, Safe Golf? Let me know what, you, what you're doing. Okay, so I got a, I got an OSHA 500, okay, construction, right, 10 and 30. Okay, general industry as well. Okay, good, perfect example, right? So, you know, open with a question, right? Lead with a question. Let's have a discussion. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on, folks. I'm moving on to 5.6. All right, so that's all part of the gain attention, right? Those three are perfect examples of how to gain attention. And then build in relevance. We want to make sure it remains relative, right? What's the easiest way to do that? Hey, can we associate it to a job we've done? Do we know somebody who's been hurt before, right? What, um, you know, what's, uh, what's the benefit of us recognizing these hazards and more importantly what's the benefit of us safely working around them and following the practices and 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 the procedures and using the equipment that the employer is providing for us so that we make sure that we're not negatively impacted right so we want to build out where relevance why are you here most of us are there we need the money i mean you know we can all say we love our job we love to do this you know whatever we want bottom line most of us need the money okay and we can't afford a step back right or a setback so just remember that. And then, of course, instilling confidence as well, right? Giving employees the sense that they can be successful in preventing accidents. Um, but the big – and look, folks, and this is the thing. You keep on hearing me hear, uh, say this accident versus incident with NCCR. Um, 
I'm not necessarily in 100% agreement. Uh, NCCER says that an accident is where property damage or personal injuries happened, and then an incident is like a near miss. Um, I go with more with what OSHA is saying and more relative, uh, um, um, more in this day what safety professionals and law enforcement goes with, which is that incidents normally could have been prevented, and if they couldn't have been prevented, then they're probably an accident. So therefore, most are usually incidents, right? Um, and then it depends on the degree of severity. Okay. So, uh, so it just depends, right? So, okay. Um, but, you know, been instilling that confidence, right? Giving employees the opportunity to uh, share their experiences. So, th because that way it gives them a little bit more familiarity or confidence with the subject matter that we're teaching. Um, the confidence comes from knowing what's expected and having the tools and the skills to do so, right? So the best ways that NCCR says that we can build confidence is communicating clear and realistic goals. You know, so perfect example is by the end of this training, um, you're going to be able to safely access, a sca inspect the scaffold before walking on it, right? In order to assure that there are no slip hazards and that the proper guards are in place in order to, to better protect your health and safety on that scaffold, right? Perfect example. Um, providing employees with the proper tools and equipment. What's the proper tools and equipment? Well, it may be, um, it, it may be a scaffold for them to practice on, right? Might be their fault, personal fall arrest equipment. So that's a perfect example of tools and equipment that the proper tools and equipment that the employee may need, okay? And then uh, providing adequate training. Um, you know, and it's not just adequate training. It's just not the quality of trainer or trainee and the, and, and the resources that are being used, but it's also appropriate in the right amount of time. Okay. So remember that as well, right? Is that appropriate in the right amount of time is a big, big key. Okay. And then, uh, fostering satisfaction. Okay. Uh, for, 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 for someone to continue to act, right. Or to perform at a high level, they have to get some satisfaction from it. So for many employees, there's an internal sense of satisfaction that comes from performing the job and staying safe on the job. You know, base, you know bottom line, hey, we have, um, whatever, 650 man days, right, without a lost time incident, okay, or without a recordable, right? Um, you know, we hit a million man hours, a million and a half man hours. That, that's a sense of pride. It's a sense of satisfaction. But you know what, folks? Let's break it all the way down to the JSA level, right? The TSA level, job safety analysis, the task safety analysis. Let's break it down to the, to the daily level. If the employees understand the JSA and the TSA more, you know, and we can't make everybody care, right? But, you know, and then that's when we got to decide the ones that don't care and that don't work properly, you know, what discipline is, what discipline is going to be implemented, right? All the way up to termination. And, and a lot of times that's not our decision to make, but we may be part of that decision-making process. Um, you know, but that whole satisfaction of knowing that, hey, you know what? We did another job. We did, not only did we no one get hurt, but we followed the process. Because remember, folks, bottom line, that job safety analysis, right? That task safety analysis. Uh, that's that's where safety is often incorporated. It's, it is a process. If we follow it from line one to line 26 or line 12 on the JSA, the belief is that everyone should be safe at the end of the job, right? So, so just remember that, right? To, that those are milestones, you know, and those are items that we can talk about and share and discuss and have employees take more of a leadership role and uh, about providing insight, right? And then remember discipline, right? It's a large part of the everyday work. There's always uh, there's always going to be problems to be resolved, right? There's always decisions that are going to have to be made, especially in fast-paced, uh, deadline-oriented uh, businesses like construction. So as safety professionals, it's likely that we're going to encounter both uh, simple and complex behavioral problems. You know, a lot of times it's, it's going to be time versus money. Sometimes it's la laziness and poor attitude, right? So a few of the most common employee problems, remember this, poor attitude towards the workplace for some. Right, inability to work with others, possibly, uh, absentee and turnover. Right, especially uh, companies that are more challenged. Believe it or not, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with this, tend to have more turnover. I mean, so a lot of times, turnover will wind up being a leading uh, leading indicator that we're going to probably wind up taking a, a significant injury, illness, or fatality, uh, because because the culture is not there and the employee buy-in is not there.
Okay. Um, you might also hear them a lot of times they're using them on the production and operation side and they'll use them for anybody who's out there that's on that side. And you guys will use it as a KPIs, right? Key performance indicators. Uh, KPI, perfect example of it, is, um, is, is leading indicators. It's telling us that there's going to be an issue with our deadlines, right? Uh, with our workmanship and craftsmanship, with injuries or illnesses or fatalities, and that we're at higher risk of them. So perfect example. Okay. And then a uh, poor attitude towards the workplace. Sometimes employees just have a poor attitude. Some of them have them for a good reason. Some of them don't. Okay. But if it's the workplace that's giving them the poor attitude, we need to fix it. And if it's the employee that's bringing the poor attitude in and threatening to poison other employees, and, and they're also poisoning their own culture and, and health and safety, and then again, we need to fix it somehow, right? Um, an employer with a poor attitude uh, may create a safety hazard, right? Uh, in, in one of two ways. First of all, an employee with a poor attitude might unintentionally create an unsafe working conditions uh, through sloppy or shoddy work, right? Basically, substandard work or, or safety practices on professional behavior or carelessness or, or just or, or, or just not care or, or have any regard for anyone else's health and safety or their own, right? Or uh, just be lackadaisical about it. Also, second, the employee um, uh, an employee with a poor attitude might intentional uh, might intentionally create unsafe working conditions uh, through tool and equipment equipment sabotage, right? Material damage or fighting. So that person may be looking to have a problem or cause a problem and either cause their own injury or simulate an injury for themselves, right? To work the co workers comp, to ride the workers comp train or just to cause problems in the workplace. So just just keep it in mind. Okay, poor attitude on the jobs can be caused by bad relationships with fellow employees. It could be personal problems, negative perceptions of supervision or of leadership. Um, it could be a dislike for the job in general. It could just be a dislike for working, period, right? The first step in changing the employee's power attitude is to determine the cause of the problem. The best way to determine the cause, uh, you know, of poor attitude is to talk with that employee one-on-one. -on -one. Listen to what they have to say. Ask questions to uncover as much information as we can. You know, once the conversations occurred, you know, and the facts have been addressed, and then we can start to determine how to correct the situation and to turn the negative attitude into a positive one. Um, if we discover that a problem stems from, uh, from factors in the workplace or surrounding environment, and then uh, several choices to remedy the situation. First, we can be moved from uh, we can have the employee move from one situation to a more acceptable job. Maybe they're not happy in the job they're in. Maybe they're not happy with the people they're working with. Right. Next, maybe uh, part of the work environment uh, found to be causing uh, poor attitude can be changed. Or finally, maybe steps can be taken to change the employee's attitude so that the so that the work environment is no longer a negative factor. And, and then not only that, and if all those don't work, and then you may even have to see about moving that employee somewhere else to another facility or moving them out, right? Or, or helping them, giving them more training, whatever it takes, okay? So we're going to go ahead and do one more section, folks. We're going to go ahead and finish this next uh, page and a half, and then we're going to go ahead and break out in seven to eight minutes for a break, okay? Um, inst uh, inability to work with others. Some people just don't work well and play well with others, Okay. So what happens, you know, we have to provide that teamwork environment, but we also have to respect the fact that not everybody, you know, wants to be uh, shoulder to shoulder working with everybody. But we do have to we do have to take consideration that the workplace, it's a team environment, folks. Right. And the best way to determine the reason for individuals that don't get along with others and uh, that don't work well is to talk to the parties involved. Right. Talk to everybody. Uh, speak with the employees you know, and any other individuals on the site in order to find out what the source of conflict is. Um, once we have a reason for the conflict and once we find it out, and then it's going to be a whole lot easier to, to figure out how we're going to respond, right? Take men, um, uh, there may be a way to resolve the problem and get the workers communicating and working as a team again. You know, if not, and then there may be nothing that we can do. And if so, and then we're going to have to decide what we have to do since we cannot maintain or create a harmonious relationship, right? Or a friendly relationship there. Um, and then since it can lead to an unsafe work condition, and then we have to, we have to report the situation, right? We have to report it to supervision. It may go back to human resources. It may go back to leadership management. You know, in that case, what's going to have to be determined is does one person or persons or group have to be transferred, right?
And then, of course, it can also lead and it could also affect or it could affect absentee and turnover. And absentee, absentee and turnover is, um, is uh, absenteeism and turnovers are, are really great and, and, and it could cause a lot of issues. And why? Because it may be somebody who is an integral part of that team that all of a sudden is absent, right? They may be absent due to personal reasons. They may be due to absent uh, because they don't want to work. Certain holidays may be up, maybe a special occasion in that person's life. Maybe that person uh, likes Elvis's birthday and they don't work on January 8th, right? Like Gary Busey in, uh, in uh, DC Cab. You know, maybe that person uh, drinks a lot or is in a bowling league. So Thursday nights they go out and often they miss Friday, right? Or substance abuse, right? Or family issue or health issues of their own. So different reasons why we may have absenteeism. And then, you know, so it may become an issue where, where absenteeism may be addressed as well because it's affecting our safety in the workplace. And then, and then ultimately a uh, turnover, right? References, um, to the loss of employees, um, when, whenever they're fired, they choose to leave the company, whatever it is, it may, it may affect other employees. And then some major causes of turnover, uh, they could be things like non-competitive wages. The company doesn't pay enough, right? Other companies pay more. The benefits may lead workers to leave one company uh, to another company that pays higher wages or offers better uh, health benefits or, or safety bonuses or just benefits altogether, right? And then remember, also lack of job security, right? It might cause workers to leave and find more permanent employment or where they perceive it to be more permanent. Um, unsafe project sites uh, might cause employees to leave too for safer work sites. Like, you know, hey, you know what? They don't give me uh, a PPE that I'm comfortable in here. You know, I think they take the cheap way out, right? Or uh, they have us working in scratch glasses uh, that, that are hard to see through. They don't get us the appropriate... Uh, aerial lifts or scissor lifts that we need when we need them, right? They make us make makeshift items. So just items like that can totally affect the workforce. Also, workers um, will leave and find a less uh, stressful work environment sometimes, right? Uh, everything else could be in place, but maybe they just don't want the stress. And then workers uh, will move on and if they feel like working conditions are inadequate, right? So I'm, I'm not happy with the working conditions in this work site. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to go ahead and go somewhere else. So these are all different reasons why why employees might move on, right? So, and like we said, absentee and turnover, it's they often is a leading indicator or it could be a lagging indicator, right? It, it could be a leading indicator to tell us that there's some issues here in this workplace and that it may be leading to an injury, illness, right, or fatality uh, if, if we don't start to control it. But it's also a lagging indicator telling us that, hey, you know, on our human resources side, on our leadership management or on, cost, on company investment into the employees or into the commitment into safety, that employees do, that they don't want to, um, that they're not, you know, that they don't feel maybe appreciated. Okay. So, uh, you know, maybe they don't like the fact that a supervisor left or a coworker left and went to make more money for another company. So, so just, just keep all those items in, in mind also. Okay. And then, um, and then folks, like, like we said, and then you'll see just a quick summary there, right? Uh, like we talked about just recapping the three types of communication that we started out with, uh, verbal, nonverbal, and written. Uh, like we said, those are the three different types of uh, communication. So uh, when we come back, we're going to go ahead and keep on going. Uh, as you notice, again, folks, there's 10 questions right at the end of that uh, chapter. Uh, folks, for, for any of the new people that are out there, I'm going to be emailing you in the next couple of days. Each module in both books, each module has questions in white at the end of uh, the module, and, um, and I'm going to be sending you the answers for both books, okay? So uh, they're there for you to go ahead and test yourself and try yourself out, and, then, and they're a great uh, help and resource also to work towards the end of module test, although uh, some of the questions uh, may be relative. Other ones will come through the readings of, of uh, items that we discussed through the book, okay? So what we're going to do is let's break out. It's 20 minutes till. Let's do this. Let's take 15 minutes. Let's stretch out a little bit. And what we're going to do tonight, folks, is I'm going to take things just a little bit out of order. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop this recording now and uh, so we can wrap up on module five. When we come back, I'm going to skip module six, folks, because it's so long. We're going to catch module six next week. 
uh, just because I don't want to get it started and not be able to finish it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to skip module six for tonight. We're going to go ahead and move on to module seven tonight, which is another short module, and it's for emergency action plans, okay? So like I said, it's um, the modules don't really, they, they kind of piggyback on each other, but it's nothing... Uh, nothing really significant so we're going to go ahead and, and talk about emergency action plans tonight which is module seven when we come back and then on thursday when we come back we're going to hit it hard and we're going to get through all of module six which is almost uh which is almost 40 pages okay so it is uh 20 minutes till folks i'm going to go ahead the the webinar will remain open i'm just going to go ahead and stop my record or actually um yeah i'm going to stop my recording right now and then after we will go ahead and kick it back up OK, so if for any reason, if I lose you folks, uh, just do me a favor. Uh, if I lose you, it's going to be within the next five minutes. Just just come back and load right back up. And the reason is, is because it may do that since I'm stopping the recording. OK. All right. Thanks, folks. And I'll see you in just a few minutes. OK.